Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We will uh, be there this morning in a couple places throughout Scripture as we continue uh, our study of the healthy church. And uh, I know this is on all of our minds this morning, everything that took place yesterday in our country, and uh, we look at what takes place uh, when it comes to things like that and wonder where in the world is the Lord in the midst of situations like this. Well, we can know and trust and believe that God's Word makes it clear, very clear that He is sitting on His throne and very active at this point and in control. But what I want to do as we begin this morning is just pray a prayer of unity uh, for our country as we go into a time of elections. We believe that God's Word calls us to pray for our leaders and to pray uh, grace and peace and mercy and unity over all of those that are in leadership and to pray for their salvation for the ones who do not know him. And so we're going to go to a time of prayer right now. And if you will, pray with me as we lift up our country at this time. Father, uh, we come to you in these moments and we ask God uh, as we look across the landscape of our nation. And it can look like chaos taking place and craziness, but you are the God who is sovereign and in control. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll come over our land and you will heal this land. We pray, Lord, as the Bible says, that we will turn to you and turn to your word and obey what it says. Father, we pray for the unity of our country. We pray for those uh, that are in leadership today. We ask for uh, the people that were involved and those that have lost their lives even in the midst of this chaos. We pray for their families. We uh, lift up uh, the needs of those that are dealing with the loss. We pray uh, for the election season coming up as well, God, that you will lead it. We know, as the Bible says in Daniel, you raise up kings and you take kings out. And so we know in your sovereign hand you will bring about your plans for us. But we ask in this time that you will heal our land and we pray for unity in this situation. We ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are in a series called uh, The Healthy Church, coming to a close. Next week, we will finish up uh, The Healthy Church, looking at what a church should be doing. What are the purposes of the church? We've considered uh, things like worship and evangelism and service. And last week, we uh, talked about the uh, notion of fellowship and today we're going to come uh, to the issue of prayer. Tom Rayner put it well. He said, the healthy church is a praying church. The healthy church is a praying church. That's important for us to consider today. In fact, throughout uh, the Word of God, beginning in Acts chapter 2 with the beginning of the church, you see that they devoted themselves to prayer. Out of all the things the early church could have been doing, by the way, out of all the things we could be doing today, the Bible calls us to devote ourselves to prayer. And today we're going to talk about how the healthy church prays, not just talks about prayer, not just gives it lip service today, but actually practices prayer. There's a problem, though, in the church today. If I'm being honest with you, uh, quite frankly, we don't pray like we should we may talk about prayer, but we actually don't pray uh, like we should. I don't pray like I should. I believe in the power of prayer, and I would ask you today, you would say, of course, I believe in the power of prayer, but we don't pray uh, like we should. A lot of us just talk about it. I read a story this week about a shepherd. I'm sure this is a true story. He was tending to his flock one afternoon, afternoon, and the businessman there was driving around, and so this young businessman pulled up in his SUV, and he got out in his uh, wardrobe, complete with a suit and a tie, and he had this nice-looking watch on his wrist, and the businessman walked up to the shepherd, and he said this. He said, you know, what you guys do as a shepherd, I mean, it really just intrigues me. He said, I'll tell you what. This is a businessman talking to the shepherd. He said, I'll tell you what, if, if you would do this for me, if I could guess how many sheep are in your flock, if I could tell you how many sheep that you watch over, would you give me one of your sheep? Well, the shepherd looked at the businessman, kind of confused. Why in the world would this guy need uh, a sheep? But he said, well, there's no way he's going to figure this out. And so he said, well, of course, if you could guess how many sheep I had, I'll, I'll let you have one. And so uh, the young businessman, of course, uh, sneered, and he walked back to his car, and he opened the tailgate of his SUV. He pulled out this computer. He had this small little printer next to his computer, and he started typing in this GPS coordinate and used this NASA satellite thing, and he printed it out, 
took the sheet over to the shepherd and he said, you have 1,235 sheep in your flock. Shepherd looked at me and said, wow, that's amazing that you could figure all that out. And of course, the businessman took a smile and he picked up one of the animals there and he put it in the back of his SUV. Well, as soon as the businessman was about to pull off, the shepherd said, hold on one minute. If I could tell you what business you're in, would you give me back my animal? Well, of course, the businessman said, there's no way he's going to figure this out. He sneered and he said, uh, well, I, I guess so. If you could tell me the business I'm in, I'll, I'll give you back your animal. So the shepherd looked at the businessman and he said, well, you're a consultant. He said, wow, how'd you figure that one out? And he said, well, there's a, a couple reasons that I figured this one out. He said, number one, you came here without being invited. <laughs> he said, number two, you told me something I already know and charged me for it. <laughs> and then he said this. I thought it was good. He said, you also don't know anything about my business, and I'd really like to have my dog back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try really hard to fit that into my sermon some way. <laughs> no, the truth is, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to prayer in the local church today, when it comes to prayer in our life, a lot of us act like a consultant. See, we may say we know a lot about prayer, but when it comes to actually experiencing the actual practice of prayer, many of us today, many in the Christian church today, know very little about what it means to practice prayer. But if we're going to be a healthy church today, if we're going to be all that God has called us to be, we have to be a church. We have to be a people committed to prayer. We have to give ourselves to it because here's the main point for today. The main focus, if you're taking notes, is this. The healthy church is a church that practices prayer. Tom Rainer, again, put it well. The healthy church is a church that prays. It's a church that prays. It's a church that gives itself to prayer. We can give ourselves to many things today, but the healthy church is a church that prays. We have to focus on that this morning. And so what I want to do in the next few moments we have together, in the remaining minutes that we have here in this room, I want to draw our attention to three foundational principles of prayer that we must understand, that we must focus on. And so if you're taking notes today, I've outlined my message around three foundational principles of prayer that will draw us in in order to become a church or to continue to be a church or to become people of God who pray. These are three principles you want to focus on in your life. Number one this morning, we have to consider the priority of prayer, the priority of prayer. If we're going to be a church that prays, if we're going to be a church that focuses on the power of prayer in our life, we have to make it a priority in our lives. It has to be of most importance to us. We have to pray. In fact, if you search the scriptures, you see the men of God throughout the Bible, the women of God throughout the Bible who have given themselves to prayer. I think about men like Moses in pain and pleasure. He gave himself to prayer. In the midst of leading thousands and thousands of people, he gave himself to prayer. David wrote a whole book about his prayers. That's the book of Psalms. He detailed for us the priority of prayer throughout every psalm, knowing that he could talk to God. Solomon dedicated a whole building, the temple, to prayer. First Kings chapter 8, verse 42 says that he desires for them to look upon the temple and to seek the Lord in prayer. You think about the prophets prayed. Jeremiah was a man of prayer. Daniel, for a moment, just consider Daniel. I heard this week, it was an interesting fact. They said that some estimate Daniel prayed 65,000 times in his life. What have you done 65,000 times? Can you imagine that? 65,000 times. If he started praying at the age of 15, many believe that he lived into his 60s, 70s, or 80s, somewhere around there. If he prayed three times a day, he entered the throne of grace 65,000 times. You talk about an example of somebody who made prayer a priority. The prophets prayed. Our Savior by the way, the greatest example of a man who prayed was our Savior while on this earth. He was a man committed to prayer. Luke chapter 22 tells us that it was his custom to pray. 
It was his custom to go away and pray. He spent all night, Luke chapter 8 tells us many times, or excuse me, John chapter 8 tells us that many times he took whole nights to pray. Can you imagine that? When was the last time you took a night to pray? Jesus found himself praying in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night. He would avoid crowds. (laughs) He would literally avoid people trying to seek him so that he could pray. He taught people how to pray. He encouraged people to pray. If our Savior can pray, can we not pray? Can we not make it a priority in our life if that's what Jesus did? The Apostle Paul prayed. The early church prayed. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, what did they do? They devoted themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that they continually sought the Lord in prayer. They continued to go to God in prayer. They made it a priority. Anytime you see the Holy Spirit move throughout the book of Acts, you always see a people who is praying. They prayed. The Apostle Paul Prayed. He called his people to pray. And by the way, this is not just a principle that we see in Scripture. It's a command to follow. I want you to see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. Pastor Paul spent uh, several weeks last year looking at this verse. But I think it's important for us to consider again 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17. A familiar verse to all of us. It says this, pray without ceasing. Pray and never stop. Always, as one translation put it, always keep on praying. Make it a priority in your life. This isn't just an example we see in Scripture. This is a command that we are to follow. It doesn't mean that we're going to be on our knees 24-7, but this is like, as uh, Pastor Paul would say, a hacking cough. Something you're going to do recurring. Something that is over and over and over again. We're going to make it a priority in our life. Is prayer a priority in your life today? Is it the first thing you go to or is it just something that you consider when you need something? You see, if we're going to be about prayer, we have to first make it a priority in our life can't be second choice. It can't be something we just go to when we need something. We are to pray at all times and in all seasons for the Lord to move in our life. So is it a priority or is it just a part of your life? Think about that for a moment. You may say, well, Pastor Nick, I pray. Of course, I pray. I spend a few moments every day praying and then I go off to the next thing. Well, maybe it's just a part of your life, but not a priority and many times we try to make prayer just something that we put into a box and we do on an occasion but it's not all of life it's not a priority it's not the first thing we go to let me just illustrate that for you I'm going to show you a picture up here and probably offend every single one of the cooks and chefs in here JT already told me he was offended this morning but I need to show you a picture here because I want to illustrate this for you this is what you call one of those TV dinners how many grew up on TV dinners this okay yeah that's right, you're still eating it, right? <laughs> We're going to pull one out uh, today and eat it for lunch. We've grown up on TV dinners. This was the big thing. Or I grew up as a kid eating what we called Lunchables, you know? You got everything you needed right there in your Lunchable pack or in your uh, TV dinner. And you had, you know, like your, um, uh, your mystery meat there on the bottom. <laughs> Not exactly sure what that is. Saul's, I don't know. Salisbury steak. I, they know this uh, some of y'all are eating this today, you know. <laughs> then you got your mashed potatoes up there, and then you got your uh, green beans, and then you have, I have no idea what that is in the middle. I think brownie. it's a brownie. I thought maybe it's what the dog ate for dinner or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you got everything you need right there in your TV dinner, right? That's why parents like it. You don't got to do anything but heat it up, and everything's separated too. By the way, I don't like my food touching. Anybody else like your food touching? Uh, no. Uh, uh-uh. it's going to be, that's why I like those plates that we do at fellowship meals. By the way, Miss Cindy, mark it down. I like those plates that have the individual cups, you know, so you can put like, you know, everything right here. Nothing touches, okay? <laughs> you want it separated. Listen, some of us do that with our prayer life. You know what we do? We have our, our family life over here. We have our recreational life over here. We have our, our, our career down here. And then maybe up here. 
You following me today? Maybe up here we have our spiritual life. And up here, compartmentalized, separated out, we pray. Maybe five minutes a day we spend time in prayer. We say, God bless this day. And then God just sends us on like we don't need prayer anymore. See, some of us separate this out when we consider prayer, and this is our spiritual life, and God says, that's not going to make prayer a priority. You're just making it a part of your life instead of a priority in your life. And if we're ever going to see God move in our church, if we're ever going to see God move in our life, it can't just be separated. It can't just be a part. It has to be a priority. So I'm going to ask you again, is prayer a priority in your life today? Or is it just your spare tire? You think about that for a moment. When was the last time you thought about your uh, spare tire this morning? I would submit to you that most of you, if not all of you, didn't think about your spare tire today until I said it. (laughs) You know why? We don't think about a spare tire until we, what? Need it. Until we need it. It's the same way with prayer. Some of us treat prayer like a spare tire. We just go to it. We need something. God, I'm in trouble. Will you help me with this? God, I'm not thinking about the good things in my life. God, I'm not thinking about all the moments in my life. I just need something. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pull my spare tire out. I'm going to pull prayer out and use it. God says if we're going to be a healthy church, we have to devote ourselves to the practice of prayer. We have to give ourselves to prayer. So I'm going to ask you again this morning, and I want this to sink in. I want to make sure that you hear it today. Are you prioritizing prayer, or is it simply a part of your life? I don't know about you, but I want to see God move in this place. I want to see God move in my own heart. I want to see God move in in your life. It's not going to happen apart from us prioritizing prayer with everything we do. Some of us have simply just pigeonholed, I like this, pigeonholed our prayer life. You know what I mean by that? We've just separated it out. We've siloized it. We haven't let it seep into all the other parts of our whole being. You know what that means? That means when you're driving in the car with your kids in the morning, you know what you do? You pray. When you... Uh, when you're at work and there's a problem going on, you know what you do? You pray. I like the way one author put it. In fact, I'll give you four simple ways. If you say, Pastor Nick, I want to start prioritizing prayer in my life, or I want to ensure I'm doing this, there are four simple times that you can pray. Number one, you need to pray uh, when you are in your waking moments. When you wake up from the day, Psalm chapter 5 tells us to pray. When you get up out of bed, when you open your eyes, God, thank you for another day. In your waking moments, you pray. In your, number two, waiting moments, you also pray. When you're waiting on God to move in your life, you know what you do? You pray. When you're waiting in the car rider line, when you're waiting to pick up your kids from the swim meet, when you're waiting to pick your grandkids up from the ball practice, you know what you do? You pray. When you're in the midst of a difficult circumstance in your life, and you're waiting for God to move, you know what you do? You pray. You pray in your... Waking moments, your waiting moments, and you say, well, Pastor Nick, I want to prioritize it even more. You know what you do? You pray in your whispering moments. When you're about to walk into those meetings that are difficult at work and you can't say a prayer out loud, what do you do? You pray. (laughs) You pray. When you're waiting on the doctor to come into the room because you're waiting on the prognosis, you know what you do? You whisper a prayer. In those moments that you can only whisper in your life, you sprinkle those times with prayer. So you know what you do? You pray. You want to make prayer a priority? You pray when you wake up. You pray when you're waiting. You pray when you whisper. And then finally, you pray when you're waning. You pray when you're waning, when you're about to go to sleep, when you're putting those kids to bed, when you're thinking about your grandkids. And you know what you do? You get in bed and you pray. Let your last thoughts be to God. Make it a priority in your life. And then here's What happens, though, here's the second principle I want you to see this morning. When you begin to prioritize prayer in your life, not only will you understand and not only will you consider the priority, but it will also turn into uh, the the power of prayer. That's the second principle I want you to see today. They're connected. If you want to see the power of God move in your life, you will prioritize prayer. It's the same thing. As you prioritize prayer, if you're following me today, if you prioritize prayer, guess what happens? You begin to see the power of God in your life. You begin to see the power of prayer move in your life. This is seen throughout Scripture. I just want to take you to one place, though, this morning. If you go through the book of Acts, you'll see every time, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11, all of these places, you see the men and the women of God praying and God moves. 
The power of prayer moves. Acts chapter 12. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 this morning quickly. I want you to see uh, the power of prayer, the example, the experience of what takes place when God's people pray. We find here in the middle of Acts, there are the apostles who are preaching God's word. Specifically, uh, Peter is preaching God's word. He's preaching the gospel. And of course, the Jews are still angry at him. The Romans are not... Uh, uh, are not uh, happy about what's taking place in the kingdom. And so what do they do? Well, they throw Peter in prison. In fact, it was prophesied to Peter that he would lose his life. And so Peter here, I believe, in Acts chapter 12, he's thinking this is the end. <laughs> he's thinking he's coming to the end of his life, and uh, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. He's sitting in prison, as verse 3 and verse 4 tell us. And I love this, verse 4, notice this now, chapter 4, or excuse me, chapter 12. It says, and when he had uh, apprehended him, he put him, that's Peter, in prison, and delivered him to four quarterings of soldiers to keep him, tending after him, watching over him. He's tied down, by the way. He's strapped down in chains. You say, well, why in the world is Luke adding all these details? He's adding these details to tell us it's a hopeless situation. It's hopeless. <laughs> On this side of eternity, in, in, in the finite mind of a human, this is a hopeless situation. Peter is not getting out of this. But I love this. The whole narrative hinges upon verse 5. I want you to see this. Verse 5, but Peter therefore was kept in prison, but what? But prayer. Isn't that good? But prayer was made without ceasing, without ceasing there, of the church unto God for him. That is, they were literally prostrate down, the word there gives us that picture, praying for Peter. Praying that God would remove him. And then what happens next? Verse 6, verse 7, I love this. God hears the prayers of his people. The priority of prayer is given, and the power of prayer begins to move. And when Herod, verse 6, would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Again, hopeless situation. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, you love that word, don't you? Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. In other words, he said, wake up, Peter. <laughs> Wake up, pay attention. Somebody's been praying for you, Peter. Somebody's been asking to release you, Peter. You better get up and go. And what does he do? Peter gets up and goes literally as the guards are sleeping. This is only by the power of prayer that we see God move. Peter gets up and he runs out to a place of safety. The people of God are still praying as you read the rest of the chapter. And they don't even think it's Peter. <laughs> it's like, we'll pray, but we're actually not sure what's going to happen here. God says, I've heard your prayer. You prioritize prayer, and so now as a result, you're going to see the power of it. Wouldn't you love to see the power of God in your life? You know where it begins? It doesn't begin in the spotlight. It doesn't begin on the stage. It begins on your knees. It begins getting on your knees and pleading with God to move. Are you asking God to move in your life today? Do you believe in the power of prayer do you actually think by faith God can do some amazing things? See, we can't be a healthy church today. I want to be honest with you. We can't be a healthy church today. No church can be healthy without believing, trusting in the power of prayer. It moves the hand that moves the world. I'll tell you a story. I love this. There's a man in church history. In fact, I told a story about him uh, just a few weeks ago. If you ever want to uh, follow somebody in church history that uh, believed the power of prayer and actually experienced the power of prayer, I'd encourage you to read a man by the name of George Mueller. He has an autobiography. I'd encourage you to read George Mueller. tells many stories in that uh, book about how God used the power of prayer when he prioritized it, and Mueller saw the power come about. In the 19th century, he uh, led what we call the orphan movement there, uh, in England, and he was taking care of all these orphans. Well, here's what Mueller did. He made a commitment to the Lord one day. He said, God, I want to so trust you. I want to so trust the power of prayer in my life. I want to so rely on you. He said that I'm not going to ask anybody for money. And by the way, I'm not only not going to ask anybody to support me, I'm not going to even tell anybody my needs. <laughs> Can you believe that? 
He has all these needs. He has over 300 orphans that he has to take care of. He says, God, I'm going to so trust you that I'm literally only going to go to you and you alone when it comes to prayer, when it comes to seeking you. And so one day, of course, as you know, that would get you into some sticky predicaments. I mean, you really got to trust the Lord to get to a place like that. But George Mueller gets to a place like that. And one day he wakes up, uh, a door, a knock on the door from his assistant. His assistant walks in and he says, Mr. Mueller, we have a problem. She said, we have 300 orphans to feed, and we have no food. Uh, Mr. Mueller, we only have just a few minutes before all these orphans wake up, and we literally have no food to feed them. I love this. Here's what he said. He said, here's what I want you to do. True story. Mueller said to his assistant, he said, I want you to go set out 300 plates. I want you to go set out 300 forks, 300 knives, 300 cups. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go in my prayer closet and I'm going to pray. And then he says this, he says, not maybe, not might. He said, God will provide. (laughs) It gets even better than this. He said, God will provide. And so he goes into his closet. I'm not lying when I say this. As he goes into his closet, he starts to pray. Somebody knocks on the door (laughs) and it's the baker And the baker says this, he says, Mr. Mueller, God for some reason woke me up at 2 a.m. and he told me to bake all this bread. He said, I have no reason why, but I I baked enough bread for over 300 people. (laughs) He said, can you do anything with it? (laughs) He said, well, yeah, of course. And so as he's talking to the baker, then next thing you know, the milkman, this is the 19th century, the milkman breaks down in front of the orphanage. And as you know, there's no refrigeration back then, and it's a scary thing to have over all this milk. And he walks up to Mr. Mueller, and he said, Mr. Mueller, I got a problem. He said, this milk truck just broke down. I got enough milk for about 300 people. Can you use it? <laughs> yeah, I can use it, right? <laughs> you talk about the power of prayer. You talk about God moving through those who get on their knees, completely trusting him. You know why God doesn't move today? It's not because there's a lot of sin in this world. I promise you there's a lot of sin in this world. It's because God's people don't get on their knees and beg God to move. Man, what could we do if we said, God, I'll give you my time. I'll give you my prayers, seeking you to move. God wants us to to ask. It scares me to think about uh, the times that maybe I'll get to heaven. Chuck Swindoll tells this story. He tells this story about the times that maybe when he gets to heaven, uh, God will say to him, you know, Chuck or Pastor Nick, you've done so many good things for me. You've faithfully preached God's word. You've done all these things for all these people. But he said, let me show you a room. And God comes over maybe in heaven, just imagine this, me, even for you, God comes over and shows you this room, opens the door, and you see all these gift boxes over there, you see all these unopened gifts and boxes, and he says, and God says to you, he said, I wanted to give you these things, but you never asked. I I wanted to bless you with these things, but you never asked me. You never sought me. What a scary thing to think about that maybe there's things that God wants to give us today, and, and, and he wants to bless us with these things, but we're not asking We're not believing. We're not trusting that he's going to move through the power of prayer. If we're ever going to be a healthy church, we have to get on our knees, not just praying, but trusting that God will move through the power of prayer. Some of us today, though, you know what we do? We try to schedule (laughs) and prioritize, and we try to literally work all of these details in our lives, so much so that we don't need God. American culture, 21st century, there's a lot of good things going on, and we can literally work our way with our finances and our situations and our jobs to literally set our whole life up without ever seeking God for anything. It's a scary place to be. By the way, people can do that in the ministry. People can literally get up and preach. I've done it. I know it. You can get up and preach. You can prepare a whole message without ever asking God to bless it. We can do the same thing in our life. We can literally schedule and plan and organize and orchestrate and do all of these things without ever going to God in prayer, without ever trusting that he moves through the power of prayer. If we're ever going to see God move, we have to trust the power of prayer. Finally, though, sometimes God doesn't always move in our timetable. Sometimes the power of prayer doesn't always uh, come about like we want it to. 
So we have to look at the third principle this morning. I want to close out with this. Not only do we have to consider the priority, not only do we have to consider the power, but we also have to, in order to see the power of God, we have to learn to persist in prayer. We have to understand the persistence of prayer today. See, we live in a culture that's a microwave culture, right? We put our TV dinners in there, and when do we expect it? <laughs> one minute later, all right? If it's not one minute later, there's a problem. I'm that way. The staff will ask me, well, Nick, when do you want this done? I'll say, I want it done yesterday. Anybody else like that? You want things done yesterday? It's not today, not tomorrow, yesterday. I want it done right away. See, but when it comes to prayer, many times what we see God do through prayer doesn't always happen immediately. In fact, most of the time, God works through prayer, especially when you're asking for something big. A lot of times, it happens through persistence. And that's not just by experience. That's Bible. I want you to think about this for a moment. Consider Colossians chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you can go to Colossians chapter 4. I want to show you this last passage of Scripture this morning because I think it's pertinent to our situation. Colossians chapter 4, Paul is closing this book out, trying to magnify the fullness of the Lord. And he begins to talk about the communication of God's people to the Lord. Now, verse 1 is probably a part of Chapter 3, chapter 4 probably begins at uh, verse 2, but that's here nor there. I want you to see this. Notice what Paul tells them to do. Verse 2, he says, continue in prayer. Some of your translations might say, be steadfast. I like that. Be always going to prayer. Over and over and over and over again. Paul says, be in prayer. Continue steadfastly, persist, always go to the throne of grace. And by the way, Jesus tells us to do the same thing. Luke chapter 18, probably a cross-reference in your Bible. Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable of a woman. And he tells us in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, he actually tells us why he's telling us this parable. He says, I'm telling you this parable so that you will not give up in prayer. <laughs> He says, I'm telling you this parable, this is the Lord Jesus Christ telling you this parable so that you'll continue in prayer. And then he begins to tell this story to support his thesis. And here's what he says. He says, there's this woman. There's this woman who needs something done from this unruly, crooked judge. Now, in that time period, of course, women would not get what they wanted. They're looked down upon, and that doesn't bother her, though. And so she goes to the judge, and she asks. The judge says, no, you're not getting that. What does she do? Undeterred, she goes back and says, I want this. The judge says, you're not getting it. Undeterred, she goes back over and over and over and over again. And finally, the judge gets so fed up with it, he says, lest she wear me out, I'll give her what she wants. And friend, you probably see where I'm going with this. Jesus says the same thing, not because he's a crooked judge, but because he's a good father. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Here's divine permission to go and wear me out. Keep knocking, keep seeking continually over and over and over again. Sometimes we don't get what we want because we stop after the first prayer. I just lost my sheet of paper. <laughs> we stop after the second prayer. We don't continue on. We don't continue steadfastly in prayer. And because of that, we don't see the persistence of prayer result in the power of prayer. God says, you want to see me move? Persist. Continue to ask me. Some of you are praying today about some crazy things in your life. Some of you are discouraged this morning. I know because you've told me. Some of you haven't told me, but I know you've walked in here, you're scourged, and you're saying, God, I want to give up. Pastor Nick, you don't understand. I've been asking God all these years for this thing to move in my life. I've been asking for a wayward child to come home. I've been asking God to save somebody in my life. You don't understand, Pastor Nick. If God would do this, he'd answer it now. I just want to quit. I just want to give up. Friend, if that's you, I want to ask you this one question. Who told you to quit? Who told you to stop praying? Who told you to give up? No, the Bible says persist. Knock. Ask, seek, continue seeking the Lord. Persist in prayer. You want to see God move. It's not going to happen with one quick prayer on our knees. It's going to happen over and over and over again. I heard a story about our early African-American Christian brothers who were in slavery. 
And it was told in the 1800s that they would find places in the field to literally pray and get on their knees. And they would pray so much so that literally where they would pray, the grass would wear out under them. And they would leave these deep impressions from their knees praying to the Lord. It actually became a, a point of accountability as well. Because if the people weren't praying, what would happen? The grass would grow back up, right? And so as these slaves began in the fields to see these things taking place, they would go to their brothers. And if they saw the grass grow up, they would say this. They'd say, brother, sister, your grass is growing up yonder there. <laughs> I want to ask you today, is the grass growing up under you? The grass growing up in your prayer closet this morning, are you learning to persist or are you giving up? Are you throwing in the towel? Friend, if we're ever going to be a healthy church, it's not uh, going to happen if we don't persist. God didn't tell you to quit. And God didn't tell you to give up. God didn't tell you to throw in the towel. Uh, by all stretch of what scripture says, he tells us to persist. <laughs> he says, wear me out. Try me. Ask, seek, knock, and I'll give it to you. We don't just serve a God, though, that we are to ask. We serve a God who answers. Aren't you thankful today? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says he's able to give us far abundantly more than anything we ask or seek. We don't have a God who just tells us to ask. We have a God who answers. Friends, some of you are praying for some deep things today. I want you to know, keep praying. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Whatever it is, don't give up. And by the way, as a church today, I want to encourage us to do the same thing. In fact, we talked about it there briefly in the announcements portion of our service. We're going to do, in order to live out this calling to pray, and this is the purpose of the church. This is what the healthy church should be doing. And by the way, the healthy church is made up of you and me. Okay, it's not just that person over there, it's you. Here's how we're going to live this out today. Here's how we're going to not allow the grass to grow under us this morning. We're going to do a 24-hour day of prayer. And you say, Pastor Nick, how in the world are we going to do that at 12 and 1 and 2 in the morning? Well, guess what? Those spots are already filled. <laughs> so you don't even have to worry about it now. We have a couple of deacons and trustees and Bible study leaders and staff members have already signed up for this. And we're still trying, though, to fill that complete a 24-hour period. We're starting on Thursday at 12 p.m., and then we're going to end on Friday at 12 p.m., and we need your help. You can sign up for 30-minute uh, slots, one-hour slots, and you say, well, I've never prayed that long before. This is a good time to start. I can't think of a better time to start than to come uh, to the place of worship for Gospel Baptist Church and get on your knees and pray. We'll provide all the tools for you to make it through 30 minutes of prayer, an hour of prayer, but we need you to sign up. Uh, we need you to be a part of this initiative. In fact, there in your weekly connect, you'll see uh, some of the guides there that you can follow and sign up for. We need to fill those spots. And I want to encourage you. I want to implore you. I want to say this. I want to say we want to make it a priority. And we want to see the power of God move in our church, in our lives, and in our community. I want to ask you today, would you sign up? You can scan that QR code. My assistant Kaylee is going to be in the lobby there for you to sign up. If you don't do anything digital, she'll help you sign up after the service today. You can walk out and sign up there. We'll send an email today. There's many ways that you can sign up. Would you just consider doing that? You say, well, I can't do two in the morning, three in the morning. That's okay. Do what you can. Find a time. We'll have multiple people praying. We're going to live this principle out. We're going to Follow what the Bible commands us to do and devote ourselves to prayer. Would you consider doing that today? Make it a priority so that we can see the power in order to persist in prayer. Will you pray with me this morning? With every, again, head bowed, eye closed this morning as JT and the others come to just lead us in a time of invitation, I want to just draw your attention again to the altar this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Nick, I am struggling with some things in my life. I'm trying to persist with uh, what has been given to me, my lot in life, and I just need some prayer. I want to encourage you today to know that the altar is open. We're praying for you. We have people up front, staff members who would love to encourage and pray with you. And you say, Pastor Nick, well, I need to persist or I need to make it a priority. Why don't you begin this Thursday? Why don't you just take it to heart and say, I'll sign up for a slot. I'll, 
I'll, I'll come and pray, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour. I'll just ask God to move because I believe in the power of prayer. And maybe you're in, you say, I don't believe in the power of prayer, but maybe just test God this morning. Maybe just uh, see if God would move through your prayers. Maybe you don't know if you believe in the power, but maybe you want to just see what God would do. Just give it a chance. Why don't you sign up for that? The, again, the altar is open this morning. Maybe you're here with every head bowed, eye closed. And maybe you say, Pastor Nick, I need prayer in my life. If you would, nobody looking around, just slip your hand up. If you need prayer in your life this morning, something going on, yes. Keep your hands up there. We want to pray for you. If you need prayer, I see it. I see those hands. Thank you. You can put them down. We want to pray for you. God, I ask in these moments, pray, Lord, you go before us in the lives and the hearts of those that are here today. They've raised their hands knowing they have issues, knowing they have problems, knowing they have circumstances. I pray, Father, first of all, that they'll trust the power of prayer. I pray, Lord, they'll ask and seek and knock, continue to persist, whatever it is, knowing, Lord, that you can bring about your plans in their lives. I pray over each soul today. I pray for our day of prayer. I pray, Lord, for the issues facing our church, that you'll give us guidance and wisdom to honor you with all that we say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand with us this morning, the altar is open. If you would like to pray, bring your request. We have people up here that pray with you. Let's worship the Lord today. power in prayer. And I know some of you are dealing with some things right now you've told me. I just want you to know we're praying for you. We're lifting you up, whatever it is. I want you to know we're here for you. We don't have the answers, but we know who does. <laughs> and we serve a powerful God who can encourage and strengthen and lift us up. And so I pray that you'll seek that in your life this morning. If you will, just take a seat for a moment as we close our service Today, before we do that, though, I want to just highlight just a few things. We're going to 
Also vote on a couple uh, new members to our church. We believe, again, as Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says, I'll make this clear, I promise you, for hopefully the Lord will in the next 40 years. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says, they were saved, they were baptized, and then what happened? They were added to the church, okay? They were added in church membership. We believe it's a biblical command to follow the Lord in uh, church membership. And so I want to encourage you today, if you haven't followed the Lord uh, in church membership, if you haven't done that yet, we will be happy to talk with you about that. You can stop by the Welcome Center there in the back or just visit our, our website and sign up there. Uh, we believe it's a great uh, step that you can take. In fact, the next step after baptism, I believe, is church membership in your spiritual walk with the Lord. And so let me encourage you uh, to do that today. Quickly, I mentioned last week a few details about our playground promise, and uh, many of you have asked me about that and asked our other uh, leaders here at the church what's taking place with that. We, uh, praise the Lord, brought in enough funds to basically what we did is we went back to uh, the drawing board and we began to uh, get a few quotes at the recommendation of our leaders and myself. We got a few extra quotes from a few uh, salesmen or reps here in our area. And so we finally uh, think, believe we got a direction that we're going in. And so if you're interested in the next steps that we're taking, we're praying that in the next week uh, that we can go ahead and get started on that project. It takes about six to eight weeks to actually get everything in place regardless of what direction uh, we take. But if you're interested to see where we're going with that, I want to encourage you to stop by the lobby there at one of the tables, I believe at the round tables, we have a, a half sheet. Uh, I had it somewhere here. We had a, a full sheet actually, front and back of uh, some of the details and the reasons why we went or thinking about going in this direction and a few pictures of uh, some of the items that we're thinking about and praying about uh, getting. So I want to encourage you to stop by and pick one of those up uh, on your way out. It's, again, we try to fulfill this playground promise. This is next generation ministry. We're seeking to reach the next generation, and this is just one of the many ways, as Earl Miller said just a few weeks ago, this is one of the many ways we do that here. This isn't the only thing, but it's one of the many ways that we're going to try to reach our community and uh, try to encourage those uh, to come to know Jesus Christ as well and help those grow in their relationship uh, with the Lord. And so I want to encourage you uh, to pick one of those on the way out. Well, today we have uh, two families joining our church. We were going to have a few others, but uh, Michael and Ashley Geringer, pray for Michael today. I just found out uh, right before the service that he uh, is not feeling well and wasn't able to come today, and he surely misses that, but him and uh, his wife Ashley were going to join today, but we'll uh, try to do that next week when they're here. And so lift up Michael uh, and Ashley in this time. Uh, his breathing is not doing well, and they're trying to keep him home and not have to send him back to the hospital. Uh, but today we're going to uh, at least vote on two other uh, families. The first member uh, that we're going to vote on today is Mary Witherspoon. Uh, Mary, if you're in the room today, I actually did not get a picture. If you'll just stand for me, Mary, there she is in the back, all the way in the back. Mary, if you'll just stay standing uh, for us for a moment. Mary and I uh, met this week, and I heard her uh, salvation testimony and how she followed the Lord in believers' baptism. It was actually 2008 here at Gospel Baptist Church that uh, she was led to the Lord. Laura Weeks assisted in that. God used uh, Laura to allow um, Mary to see her need for Jesus Christ. And so it was here at Gospel that she came to know Jesus Christ. And then about 2015, 2016, uh, when her mother was uh, diagnosed, that's Margaret. Many of you know uh, Margaret, her mother, who was a longtime member here at Gospel. Uh, Mary followed the Lord in believers' baptism at Fairview Baptist Church. And uh, she does not hold a place of membership, and so she'll be joining our church by uh, statement of faith. And then uh, in a moment, I'm going to invite Pastor Paul up uh, to uh, introduce another uh, couple in our church. But I failed, uh, I don't know if I failed, but I feel like I failed to open up the business meeting. You're supposed to open up a business meeting, uh, and so uh, let me do that. Uh, make sure we're following our constitution and bylaws. And, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to vote on Mary, and then uh, Pastor Paul will introduce another couple. But let me open up the business meeting for us this morning. So before uh, we go any further, do I hear a motion uh, to open our membership meeting? Motion by Ryan Hazelwood in the back, second by Gary Brown there up front. And again, Mary Witherspoon, uh, if we vote on her, we'll be joining our church. And then Pastor Paul, if you'll come up here, and Pastor Paul will introduce uh, the next family that will be joining our church, and then he will be leading the vote and closing our service out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nick. And uh, 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 we have a, a couple 
that you all know and love well. Been a part of our church family for some time now. We're blessed to have them. And that's James and Kathy Smith. Now, they wanted me to do this because they had intended to, to join back uh, my last month here as senior pastor, which was February, and something came up and, and they couldn't do it. And so uh, they asked if we could do it this way. And Pastor Nick was uh, gracious to say, yes, we can, we can do it this way. And so uh, it's a privilege for me to share their story with you. James was saved uh, in uh, January of 1984 on a Wednesday night. His and, and Kathy's daughter, who was only 10 days old, had, <clears throat> had died. <clears throat> Miss Garrett, hand me my water that's right there below you. think I could do this for five minutes without <clears throat> getting choked, wouldn't you? <clears throat> Excuse me. So their daughter, who was only 10 days old, had passed away. And of course, their hearts were broken. They had the visitation at the house. And it was... And it was at that time, uh, the night of the visitation, when... uh, James slipped into a room by himself and trusted Christ as his Savior. And uh, sometimes God uses those broken times, doesn't he? He really does. And, uh, and now, of course, he knows he'll see that 10-day-old ten daughter again one day and, uh, because heaven is our home. <clears throat> And Kathy was saved on Mother's Day a few years prior to that, 1979. And they were both, at both these times, they were attending Hilltop Baptist Church in Thomasville. And they were both baptized after they came to Christ. They were baptized there at uh, Hilltop. They've been uh, faithfully attending here for some years. And and, uh, as I said before, a sweet part of our church family. Uh, Excuse me. James has served as a deacon in two different churches and he's taught uh, young adults and boys and and, uh, uh, James and Kathy both have sang in a choir in churches and sang in the choir here as well. And they've worked in the nursery and vacation Bible school and so forth, serving the Lord. One thing I admire, many things about them, one thing I admire is I know they love missionaries. They may not want me to say this, but I know that behind the scenes, what other people don't see, I know they, they help missionaries. They have a real heart for missionaries, and that's always been a real blessing to me. I'm so happy that the Lord has led them here to gospel. I guess I should have had you stand. Go ahead and stand, James and Kathy, there, if you would, please, and your picture's on the screen. And then Mary, wherever you were at the time, at, uh, would you stand again? Yes, God bless you, Mary. So uh, with these presented to you, uh, do I hear a motion that we receive uh, Mary Witherspoon, James, and Kathy Smith into the fellowship? Terry Smith, uh, 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 Terry... <laughs> Terry Miller, and then uh, Adrian uh, Whitley with a second. All in favor, make it known by raising your right hand and say amen. 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 Any opposed like sign? 
Thank you so much. God bless you. Now, uh, we, we want you to, as soon as we dismiss in prayer, Mary, you come on up, and the Smiths will be right up here with you, and y'all just stand across the front here, and folks can come around and shake hands or bump elbows or whatever y'all are comfortable uh, with. Isn't the Lord good? He is good. Stand with me, please. And when we dismiss our service in prayer, that will close our business meeting as well. Uh, I think of that passage when Jesus' disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Wow, great message today. As we leave, let's leave with that prayer on our heart. Lord, teach us to pray. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for this wonderful day, your day, to come and worship you. And thank you for the special singing and uh, what a, how beautiful that was. We thank you for the message from God's word. Now we thank you for these new members. And we pray you'll bless them and may the church be able to uh, be a blessing to them. And may they in, in return be a blessing to the church as we all serve you together and love each other and hold each other up. And uh, continue along in our journey of faith and loving you. Uh, we pray you'd bless us as we go now. Use us to touch the lives of others. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.